I am Carol Peters. I serve as the President and CEO of United Way Next. I know each and every one of you, so thanks for being here today. I am excited about today's session because it truly is going to be a workshop, an opportunity for us to, to learn and work together. Before we get started, I'm going to turn it over to Diane, who is going to do an introduction of our guest speaker today. So Diane, take it away. Thanks, Carol. And just thank you everyone for being here. I don't know where you are right now, but I'm in Camden, Maine, where the weather is just absolutely exquisite and beautiful, sunny, and it's a crisp 41 degrees. So I hope that you have some beautiful weather where you are. Um, I normally, when I introduce people, I like to, um, I don't typically read people's bios, but when I Googled Laura Ellis, I found her most amazing bio on LinkedIn. It's so personal, and I really wanted just to share it with you all today. So Laura is a Peabody Award-winning audio producer who's been working audio for two decades. She's produced live talk shows, long-form radio documentaries, daily spot news, features, podcasts, and theatrical sound design in both traditional and non-traditional settings. Laura specializes in podcast development and coaching. She created and runs Louisville Public Media's podcast incubator, focused on developing shows by and for marginalized people. She writes a podcasting advice column, and you could ask her a question there. She's drawn to work that centers people who have traditionally been left out of mainstream media, creating spaces that allow them to tell their own stories. Laura loves writing for the ear. She loves building a team and learning what motivates them to be their best. She loves helping people take their project from a script or a pile of tape to a compelling story. She loves writing copy and making other people's copy sharper. She believes in the transformative power of sound. Laura's from Louisville, Kentucky, and she sounds like it. We just had a conversation about um, accents and such, and um, I just have fallen in love with her Southern accent. Uh, she works mostly in and for her own community, but also loves to travel, both for work and play. Her wife also works in audio and they are nerds about it together. They live with a small army of dogs. She has never used the word final in a file name anymore. So Laura, the floor is yours before, but before I do that, I also wanted to recognize and thank Terry Tolan for um, making this connection. We um, really, it's been such a blessing getting to know you and learning from you. So Laura, over to you. Well, thank you so much. I had completely forgotten what my LinkedIn bio said. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that is true. Um, thank you for that. So you can probably hear the army of small dogs. Uh, you'll probably be hearing them throughout this training because somebody's doing yard work outside. Um, so for this training, um, it's like I haven't really prepared as much of a structured presentation because I was hoping that you had to, to look at this worksheet and start to think about your answers to these questions. And what I'd love for us to be able to do is like talk through your ideas together and um, sort of everyone in the room owns their own expertise and what they're an expert in. And um, we can all sort of pitch in to give you feedback and help you refine what you came up with. So if anyone was able to do this and has something ready and wants to go first, that would be great. And if not, um, we can just kind of go through it live with one of your ideas. Laura, do you, uh, I, I don't have a, a written uh, something to review, but in your experience, is there one kind of uh, so I think about podcasts that focus on a particular subject and you have a panel or you have a speaker who's got some expertise. And then I, I think about podcasts that kind of invite a guest and have more of a conversation. I'm sure it depends on what the goal and objective is, but do you find in your experience one is more successful over the other or is it primarily depending on the audience and what the objective of the podcast is. I think they appeal to different audiences. And I also think um, they call for different strategies in terms of like publication and marketing. So what research tends to show us is that um, 
what they call a chat cast, which is we're going to sit down and have a conversation with a new person or group of people once a week or every two weeks or whatever. It's not a narrative that stretches across episodes. It's like a new conversation each time. Those are podcasts that do better when people are in their normal routines. So that's not a podcast that you want to launch your season in the summer, for example. That's a podcast that you want to launch. Um, probably avoid any kind of big things around the holidays because it's something that people rely on to come out at a certain time and it's part of their normal life. Um, a narrative show that stretches that you need people to stay with you over the course of a few episodes mm -hmm. is going to be like a great summertime show or a great show to market around like, hey, the holidays are coming. You're probably going to be traveling. Find us in your podcast app and you'll like this will give you something uh, to listen to on the plane that you won't want to you won't want to deplane when you arrive, you know, so I feel like. Both of them have their. Thank you, whoever dropped that in. I was trying to do that and it looked really weird. Um, I think both of them have their place and both of them have their audience. And it just, it's going to alter how you talk about it and how you market it and when you release stuff. That makes sense. Assuming these dogs are going to settle down. Eventually, I'm sorry if you can hear them really quickly. Okay. So I guess what I'm going to offer up is it appears to me that the group that's here today are representing really United Way Next as an organization. And we're interested for our own perspective about the podcast and Carrie and Diane um, I may need to lean on you since this is a workshop for us, right? And it's for our members. And since it appears just from the people on the screen that no one has shown up that was at the first one that might have an idea to share, we're all here more for our own interest as an organization. So um, for those who might listen to this following the session, they're going to say, oh, wow, no one's shown up except United Way Next. But I think we can still use the questions and things we've learned and talked about as a small group, a subgroup that um, was focused on this to our benefit, right? So I'm going to lean on Diane and Carrie. You know, Diane's got the questions. Yeah, why don't we just go through these questions then? Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I, I could also um, just add a, uh, an insight, you know, as I'm how I'm coming into the room today, um, because the way I thought about this originally and still think about it, but I'm not sure this is the right format, is an opportunity to repurpose existing content and jazzing it up a bit um, so that a busy professional, United Way professional could call up our podcast as they're driving to work or home from work and get a tw quick 20 minute um, something. You know, it's either inspiration or it's like a quick um, tutorial about some highlights, you know. Um, and what I struggle with is a lot of times content that we would have to repurpose um, has slide decks that go with it and I just I love what you said that you're writing for the ear so I'm I'm listening and hearing what you said um and so maybe my idea is not possible but um that's my biggest thing is how to create and use a new um delivery channel for busy professionals that they can listen to while they're driving in their car or going for a walk and not glued to their computer. And um, I just love to hear your thoughts, Laura, on is that a good idea? Is it not a good idea? Um, I don't see it as, you know, a program that's on the same week at the same time, you know, tune into this channel, but more as kind of a resource. So that's how I'm coming in and what I'm wondering about, but it may be that in your expertise, you're like, yeah, it's not really the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I remember talking about this last time um, a little bit, and I thought like this is actually on the list of like good reasons and bad reasons to have a podcast. I think this is actually uh, one of the rare good reasons to have a podcast, which is like you have this content. Um, a certain uh, number of people were able to witness it live or whatever it was, like if it was a panel, if it was an event. Um, and you need a way to steer people to it who are in other locations or who weren't able to be there live. Like, um, so the my my like traditional question for would-be podcasters is, is anybody asking for this? Like, who's asking for this? And I think in this case, like, yeah, people are asking for this. You have a need that this would fill. And the need is, um, I want this content and I wasn't able to be there for it when it was happening. Like, I just need an easy way to find it, right? You don't necessarily want to build like a huge website where it's like, click on these different buttons to hear these different things and like a whole a whole thing like that. You certainly don't want to have to make people go out of their way to find it. But I think in this case, a way to meet those people where they probably already are is in their podcast app. Like I think most of the people, I think we're probably at a point right now where like the people who are going to try listening to podcasts have probably tried it. Like we're probably not going to get a whole lot of more like new adopters of podcasting. It's been around for long enough and it's been popular for long enough. And um, there's people who are never going to try it. Um, and that's fine. But I think like a lot of the people you're going to try to reach already have a podcast app on their phone. So why not put this content where they already are and have them like, in, and have them subscribe to it and have it pop up when there's a new episode for them to listen to. Um, and I think like you're almost talking about because you're not talking about like it comes out every Tuesday and it's appointment listening. You're almost talking about building an audio archive or building an audio encyclopedia for folks who can call up your show's feed and scroll through and be like, mm, this is what I need to learn about. And I think that's cool. I just, I do think that you're going to want to adapt those pieces of content for the ear by like writing introductions and writing little guideposts to get us through since we don't have the benefit of the visual aids. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Laura. Um, I was not able to join you last time, but I did watch the recording. Um, and I don't have a specific idea, but I was thinking about United Way Next. And one of the, it's actually more of a radio show, but the TED Talk radio hour that Anoush Samarodi does where she has a theme. And I think several other uh, folks have themes. And so they kind of tie in, it could be very different stories or uh, different approaches to that theme, but it seems like the theme is kind of the piece that holds it together. And I just wondered if you, you know, thinking about this idea of content, if it were possible to, you know, add the introduction or the some threads that maybe there's some pieces that are tied together in what we have for content or might need to create. But I just, that idea of a theme, I was just curious um, about that. I mean, I personally like a thematic season. So like this season, we're going to focus on this and you kind of figure out which pieces that you have that fit into that. Um, an example that we've done at Global Public Media is we have a podcast called Race Unwrapped. And it started in 2020 when we were having like nightly protests here in Louisville. And um, we just needed a way to sort of have deeper, longer conversations than our newscasts could accommodate about the issues that our city was grappling with. And so the first season of that show was just very broad. Um, and it was it was looking at ways that race impacts our life, whether we're thinking about it or not. You know, the idea of like a fish doesn't know it's in water. This is happening around us. Some of us have the privilege not to have thought about it, but a lot of us have had to confront these things. And so we wanted to unpack that. That was our first season. And then the producer of that show, I think, did a really brilliant thing, which was for her second season, she decided to focus it more. And so she focused her second season on race and language. And she did six episodes unpacking various like aspects of race and language, like um, 
when is when is someone called a looter and when are they called a survivor for example um who you see the idea of like linguistic reclamation and who can use which words and um why that's an important like way to em empower people who have faced marginalization and that was great and then her third season she focused on race and humor and like how marginalized populations and people have used humor as a vehicle for healing from trauma and stuff. So I think that's a, an example of how you can kind of make collections almost of episodes that focus on a certain thing. And it helps you as the people producing it to know like what to put out next. Because if it's just totally broad and it's like, we're going to put out a podcast about the work of United Way Next that can be kind of intimidating. And also it doesn't give your audience a lot of information about what they can expect. I think focusing it um, thematically in, in clusters, I guess, in bundles is a good idea. So I can chime in here. Um, I'm here, you know, kind of for two purposes. One is I like podcasts myself. I um, am a private consultant and do interim work and i kind of thought of the idea of like, oh, maybe I should do a podcast. I have seen some consultants repurpose their work um, as a podcast, as just another means of like communication kind of. Um, and I almost thought of that kind of to Barbara's point about like, could United Way Next repurpose some content in the form of a podcast that could maybe, um, you know, attract new followers, gain more members for United Way Next, but also just have a different platform to be able to share information. And to me, I kind of saw it as like some of us organizations do things the way we've always done them in the past, like an email distribution list or a newsletter, and that a podcast really feels more current and like the direction that a lot of people, you know, they may not want to sit down and read or be in front of their computer, but the podcast gives them the flexibility you know, it's just, it's such a current thing to do where you can just listen as you're driving on your commute or doing, you know, housework and that sort of thing. Um, but from the United Way Next perspective, kind of where I, I got caught up and I think Laura, after our first session that I really realized is the behind the scenes, like how much work it actually takes to put together a podcast. And I shared with Carol and, you know, Diane, and we've, we've discussed it, that I'm just really concerned, you know, this isn't a business, this is a nonprofit, all of us are volunteers, you know, and to put more on United Way Next staff that already have a lot on their plate, it's not like people are looking for what could we spend hours on that would really enhance, you know, the organization, right. it really would feel like it would be a big lift for a nonprofit that's trying to maybe do this idea with volunteers, like to, to get, and then we're spread out across the country, you know, so there's like a lot of different you know, um, obstacles that I think would be in place. And I, I loved your suggestions, Laura, about I hadn't even thought of like universities that have recording studios, you know, so maybe equipment wouldn't need to be purchased, but space could be rented. But just the logistics behind all of it, it seems like it is a very big project and that the scope of it, because United Way Next does so much, it would just be like a big undertaking. So I kind of feel like a little overwhelmed in that regard. But then on the other hand, this other part of me kind of thinks, well, wouldn't it be nice to, and I, sorry, Carol and Diane to even say this again, but like just to test one season and see how it would go. <laughs> and so my thought with that though, was maybe it's not just this group of like, who's on the screen now, but is there like a university that has some students that are in their like master's degree for communication and they would love to do a podcast project and wouldn't it be great to partner with United Way Next because we do have such a big reach and like could we give them some guidance to have them be this like a project for them to do for us to kind of see what it goes and so I know I'm kind of throwing a lot out there um, but that's just kind of where I'm at I, I still think it's a great idea I don't know that it's something that I'm like highly recommending for United Way next right now. Um, but I think it's a great back burner idea. And I love that we're going through the due diligence of understanding how much of it, you know, it does involve. And on one hand, I think it'd be terrific to design it in a really great way and make sure that it's like built up as best as it can to be successful. And then I also feel like the inclination of the opposite of like, maybe we could just try it if we had a group that, you know, of, of volunteers that wanted to to explore this and maybe there was, you know, through a, a university or some partnership to be able to do it. So I'd be curious, I guess, Lauren, hearing, have you heard these concerns from others that have kind of said this to you? Like, we're a nonprofit, it sounds like a big reach. And like, do you know of any connections? Like, what could we each do maybe? Um, you know, of, like the idea of like reaching out to like our, our local colleges and universities to see if there could be some 
some partnerships there or do you have other ideas or do you think that's not, is it best to keep it internal? Um, I think that any community partnerships you can do are, are going to be great. Like, I think this mm -hmm. is a, if you can come up with a creative way that this is mutually beneficial, like what you said, is there a master's degree program that is looking for um, something to sort of let their students sink their teeth into? Is it an internship? Is it like um, this could be somebody's keystone project? I mean, I definitely hear and deeply feel the concern that this is a big undertaking and it's people who are already busy, you know, like <laughs> nobody ever comes to me and says, I have an idea for a podcast. And also I don't have a job. <laughs> like, nobody ever is in that situation. It's always the busiest people who have great ideas. And, um, and so I think, yes, like community partnerships and collaborations could be key to making this doable. I also totally get this sort of teeter-tottering between like, let's just try and see what happens. And on the other end, it's like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so much. So, I mean, what can you pause? Like, what can you pause doing to try this? Maybe there isn't anything. And so maybe this isn't the right time to try this. Um, But I think like, please don't just start trying this without planning on what you're going to give up for a while. Like, don't just add this to your plate without taking anything else off. And you may feel that, you you know, you might be able to pause another project for, I don't know, six weeks, long enough to record some stuff and get some stuff out into the world. And you might decide, like, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Um, but that goes back to, like, what does success look like? Because you're you're definitely not gonna like do a pilot season and it's gonna take off and you're gonna like it's gonna take a while to build audience too and that's gonna take more time to get the word out and make social media posts and put it in your newsletter and make sure people know that it's going on so like marketing is a whole other a whole other task that goes along with this you can't just produce the thing and then hope people find it um. So, I mean, I think going into this with um, some strategies about how you can ease the workload in another area, work in your contacts, because I'm assuming this is a group that has like a lot of contacts. Um, so work in your contacts at the university, work in your contacts at um, other recording studios, places that might be willing to partner with you. And also having a clear idea of like how long we're going to try this. For our first go like is our first season five or six episodes um make a stopping point so that you're not like let's just start this and then we'll see what happens like make a stopping point so that you have them um, so that it feels achievable and that you have a built-in place to stop and pause and um reevaluate if you feel like it's working and what could be different what could be better i think diane has a little zoom hand up I have my little Zoom hand up. Thanks so much, Laura. That was actually a, a very, um, you know, distinct conversation that um, Carrie, Carol, and I had. And, you know, I don't want to have an engagement, an exchange, an exchange and engage uh, committee conversation right here, right now. But it is very real in terms of what do you give up? Because Carol, um, hope I'm not stepping on dangerous territory here, but we were talking about the newsletter and how much effort goes into putting the United Way Next newsletter together. And if we look at our current demographic right now, which does tend to skew, you know, baby boomer, you know, Gen X is kind of young in our group, um, that introducing a, you know, podcast might be a little bit challenging for us right now, just because of our demographics where, you know, people are not doing that. And I'll be completely honest. One of the things like I, the reason why I wanted to do a podcast was because I fancy myself the next Oprah. I love having conversations with people. And I'm also wanting to know like where, you know, what are people doing now? So I was like, wow, wouldn't it be really cool to like interview, you know, Brian Gallagher, Benny Bean, you know, Elaine Chow, and like kind of bring people up to speed, like people who are like giants in the United Way movement to like kind of just have a conversation, like, a regular person, like, you know, they're still around, but 
we just need to be very realistic. There are just so many good things that, you know, you know the team at United Way Next is doing right now. And even though we want to have a podcast and we were like, hey, we could do this as a volunteer. The reality is that editing these things, marketing these things take a long time if we're going to do it well. Um, so we just, we're looking, we're looking at this from a very sobering perspective. Mm hmm. I mean, coming from public radio, I totally feel you because we we have a similar thing. It's like um, the folks who tend to support us financially tend to be older. So it's like a catch-22 because it's like you want to make stuff that appeals to younger people because you know you need to build that part of your audience for the future to be sustainable. But also, how many resources can you afford to put into people who aren't with you yet, like who aren't supporting you yet? Like you definitely don't want to turn away from the folks who already are in your corner. So it is, I mean, I wish I, I wish I knew the answer to this, but I just, I guess I'm sharing it in solidarity that it is, it's a thing that nobody really has the answer to yet. And for me, where I'm struggling, because I just saw Jim's uh, note in the chat, you know, when I think about, you know, what Barbara had mentioned and what Jim had mentioned in terms of repurposing existing content, you know, there could be value in that. But when I look at my own personal skills, I'm not an editor. And I think of the amount of time that goes into something like that. And that just seems like it's a lot of stuff. I mean, I think that there could be value in doing that at some point down the road. It's just, that's not necessarily my skill set. I won't say it's not necessarily, it's not my skill set. But I would, so Laura, the, I think within my comment in the chat, there's two things there. There's one is the repurposing webinars that we've done, but there's also the other aspect of it is, is it in your experience? And if you don't know, that's fine as well, but we currently do a ton of webinars that we record. Uh, we don't tweak them. We don't edit them. We don't refine them. They're not professionally done. We just record them off of Zoom. Can we take the audio from that and just as a start to pilot, as Carrie says, convert them, take the audio from them and put them, you know, promote them as podcasts kind of stuff. Are we really talking that much different aside from the technical aspects of editing um, the audio? But we do a ton of marketing, promoting and and put a lot of effort into hosting almost on a monthly basis content for a webinar. And so is that something we can, instead of doing uh, a webinar, just convert that effort? I, I get a sense that we're like being intimidated by this is another thing, but I want to make sure that this other thing is not that different from the work that we're doing with web webinars, is it? Well, so it's hard to say for sure without knowing what the content of your webinars is like, but um, have you ever tried listening to one of your webinars without watching the video? No. Like maybe go back and try that okay. and see how much you feel like is missing. Um, maybe even if one of you didn't get to attend one of the webinars, so you don't know what the slides were, um, have that person go listen to it with audio only and see if it's like, wow, there's still a lot of valuable stuff here. Or if it's like, wow, I have no idea what's going on <laughs> like yeah, with without, this. No, that's fair. Without looking, if mm -hmm. we use slides to make points and illustrate mm -hmm. things, I, I could see that. I could see yeah. that. But then again, like, okay, so say you have an hour long webinar. Um, maybe there's 20 minutes of it that is really valuable without the visual aids. And like, of course, then you get into the sort of tedious process of editing, but like when it comes to yeah. audio quality and editing, um, you can let the robots kind of do that. Like there's a program called Riverside that is higher quality um, video conferencing than Zoom. And it's it's designed for podcast recording remotely. 
And um, so it records like each person on their own track. So later on, when you want to edit it, if there's crosstalk, you don't have that problem. It's like easy to cut out. Like, I think some of this, we can rely on the technology to do for us. So that would elevate your audio quality a little bit above Zoom. And then there are programs, um, like there's a program called Descript that is a transcription program, but also it will allow you to edit the audio by editing the transcript. So if you see like this whole chunk of this webinar was really dependent on the slide, I'm gonna just highlight it all and delete it. It will take it out of the audio for you. So some of this stuff, like yes, there'll be a learning curve at the beginning while you learn to use the softwares that can support that kind of task. And there's gonna be a little cost, you know, associated with paying for the software license, um, not a huge cost, but once you get over that curve, I think it's gonna it's gonna make it a lot more streamlined to repurpose this stuff and keep the keep the best of it to give to your new audience. What we might do in one of these sessions planned ahead for webinars is ask the speaker not to use slides and just focus on making the point as a as a conversation or without slides and make the points in describing it audio wise. I'm just thinking about how we might be able to, to move ahead and test some of this stuff. So that addresses one aspect of some of the challenges that I'm hearing, but the, the others about the effort involved in marketing, promoting, possibly hosting, is that, materially different, the administrative aspects of it is sort of what we are doing with our calendar of events, right? Is there something different that's uh, between a podcast and a webinar that I'm missing? I mean, I think that a lot of the things that you do for the webinar are going to be analogous to podcasting tasks. Like in our first session, I put up that slide that was like all the tasks that go into making a single podcast episode. And yeah. some of that, like, for example, if you wanted to turn this webinar into an episode of your podcast, you already have a little blurb because it went out in the email. So you could use that as your show notes, like done, convert that. Um, you know, I think there was like a headline that was on that, like a heading for that. That could be your uh, podcast title. Um, you're clearly marketing it in some way, I think via email and probably other things too. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't market a podcast episode the same way and say like, hey, this, you know, coming out on Wednesday is a new episode of our podcast and it's going to be about this. Like, again, you've got that language. You can just repurpose it so you're not creating brand new stuff. You could even rewrite that into the introduction of the audio piece. So like it wouldn't take much tweaking to make that little email blurb into um, Diane saying, welcome to United Way Next podcast. On today's episode, we hear from, and then kind of like steal some of the language from that little blurb. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I do think there's going to be tasks like uploading it to the actual um, podcast hosting software that will be um, unique to a podcast. But a lot of the things I think are transferable and reusable. That's helpful. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. So I added to the chat that we have had a few events that we've recorded in the last 16 months, I'll say, that were like panels. The one that specifically stands out to me would be when we hosted our new board members and we did it more or less a Q&A and I facilitated the conversation and there was, you know, we recorded that, that could be snippets where you clip out just some of the questions that could be interesting, you know, maybe Diane, Diane's a new board member, she was on it. So, you know, Ann, Ann Fox, Diane, um, and, DJ Hampton and Keith Barsoon. So, you know, maybe you don't ask them all the same question and then get that content and repurpose it, but it's each answers a different question. So each podcast sounds a little different, but you pull that kind of content and it's a little more conversational. Um, we have a few other, there might've been another session last fall that we did 
with three different members who were part of like, we had them represent the member segments. And I think Carrie, you were part of one of those with Paul DeBazio and Susan Gilmore, similar kind of feel. So, you know, like, I'm not saying that we'd necessarily go back to those, but those would be ones that we could draw our attention to and literally just listen and say, does this resonate? Did this feel, because honestly, the new board member session, I remember when that ended and I thought to myself, this could have been a podcast. Like we could have extracted this, right? And then the other thing I'll offer is, and I certainly am not suggesting that I can take this all on, but I will say I have countless conversations with people like all of you that there's such a meaningful conversation when I'm having conversations that sometimes I say to myself, boy, I wish I had recorded this because what I just heard Mm -hmm. and what was shared was so valuable that others could benefit from hearing it. But it may not be, you know, long, long, you know, a lot of information over a long period of time. It's like there's just like 10 minutes of really good, rich something, you know. So anyway, I just want to mention that because I've always thought we could do a podcast. But I would say that when I've thought about the work involved for staff and or volunteers, it is a heavy lift, in my opinion. And I just fear even if we try to season six sessions that afterwards we'd all say, whoa, we may not want to do that again. Just because it is a lot, we, you know, we want it to be a great product. We want it to be professional. We want it to really represent us. And um, I've experienced something similar personally that I did. And I think I shared that maybe early on with Laura and others. And the commitment I made was an every week, one hour session with a group of 54 women. And after about six months, I said to myself, what have I done? But I still had another year of information to go through because you don't get through 54 interviews in one year. So we had to push people out, we had to avoid holidays and it took about a year and a half to get through it. So that's just my thoughts. Joe. Yeah. I'm wondering if um, there's some possibilities if we think in terms of uh, a kind of a modified TED Talk, not a TV show, uh, obviously no video. But my notion is, is if we either tapped into Carol's experiences, which may be some of the most comprehensive sense of current interest and need in the field, based on many, many conversations with people all over the country, and identified people with expertise that's relevant to what folks are apparently most interested in and had you know appropriate individuals, whether they're current members or folks that aren't current members but are in the field, which would be another connection, um, with some guidelines down to uh, uh, relative to the recording of it, you know, whether that's Riverside or what have you, and the editing of it, and whether we could create a few samples with minimum staff burden uh, and see if we had something worth testing. Yeah, I'm thinking of of, uh, Ed John doing a piece on developing endowment programs or plan giving program, you know, kind of, uh, kind of an intro to a topic of interest or potentially of interest to a lot of local United Ways. Yeah, I was thinking plan giving office hours uh, would be uh, recorded sessions that might have interesting potential for editing to yeah. podcast. And we've, re- we've recorded all those, so that's an option. They just use visuals in almost all those, I mean, all of those sessions have visuals, so. Mm. Sorry, Laura. Is it a session saying like how to persuade people to leave legacy gifts or is it a session about like, if I'm making my will, how do I make a legacy gift? Uh, How to persuade people to give legacy gifts. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, I have a thought, but I want Barbara to go first. Well, if it's on that, though, go ahead, because mine's on a little bit of a different topic. That's kind of on a different topic, too. So Okay. <laughs> um, 
and, you know, we've heard the TED Talk idea, and I just wanted to say that, you know, TED Talks are short. They're like 18 minutes. You know, there's rules. It has to be, and you have to fit within the rules of the TED Talks. And for me, in my mindset of, you know, something you could listen to in the car, you know, I'm thinking like a half hour max, like 20 minutes, half hour. But I wanted to ask you about that, Laura, because a lot of the things that you talked about at the last session, it sounded like they were, you know, my podcast hour. Um, and I know you weren't tied into it, but is there, you know, a rule of thumb, you know, is is too short, too short, or, you know, if you're going to go to all that effort, you should at least make it longer. Just any thoughts about the length? I usually encourage new podcasters to go for around 30 or 40 minutes. Um, there are some ideas that are by nature bite-sized. Um, and I think like if that's what your show is, then that's what it is. And you say like, the, here's a show where we spend five minutes asking everybody one or two questions. Um, that's not what it sounds like you're talking about for this particular thing though. Um, I would say for the type of thing you're talking about, 20 to 40 minutes. Now I will say too, um, if you're repurposing content that's longer, you a way to get sort of two episodes for your book is to make a two-parter out of it. So like if you talk to somebody for an hour and most of it was really interesting, then make it a part one and part two. There you've gotten two pieces of podcasting out of the same thing that you've already recorded once so like there are certain tasks that have to be done twice for that but there are um some of the, the the main chunks of it are already there if that makes sense i just i personally and i know i've heard like a lot of feedback about if i'm gonna be listening for an hour it better be fantastic <laughs> like it better be either just a great, great, great guest, or it better be like, you better be holding my hand and like narrating me through this and keeping me with you, like hitting breadcrumbs, like reminding me why we're listening to this and who we're listening to. And um, I just think it's probably a little more accessible to do a 25, 35-ish. Um, so let me share my thought before, and then I'll go to Carrie. Um, is there any funding for this? <laughs> this might be a dumb question, but like, is there any possibility that you can approach a business who might be, or, or a foundation um, who might be interested in putting their name and support behind something like this because it feels like an innovative step for the United Way Next um, and saying like, hey, um, we want you to be our sponsor. We'll thank you X amount of times on each episode and use that money to hire a freelance editor slash producer to do some of the stuff that y'all don't have expertise in that is like intimidating you the most. We thought That's about that. <laughs> We've thought about that. Yeah. Getting a sponsor who would really support the show. So I guess the question I'd have is what would we need to budget? Assuming we did a actual series for a season. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many episodes that would be, but based on your experience and expertise, what would be maybe the minimum number of shows that you'd recommend? And what would that look like in a budget? So I think I would start out with maybe an eight episode season as your test, because that's long enough to get some momentum, but short enough that if you need to bail, you, if you freak out, you're like, you all, well, you're like, we only have seven left. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it feels like an achievable number that would still feel like an accomplishment. Um, and so if you're just repurposing stuff, it depends on kind of what you feel like you can take on. Like, I feel like just from the little that I've known y'all, you could probably script your own introduction. You could probably write that like, you're good at coming up with like the peppy promotional language that needs to be in a in um the top of a podcast script. The stuff at the top of the episode that's going to make me be like, ooh, I want to hear this. You know, like, um, I feel like you have that expertise in this room. Um. 
and you obviously don't need to hire somebody to voice this stuff or host it because you've got that in the bag too. Um, so what you're really needing is somebody to deal with the actual tape and putting the stuff where it belongs in the hour, like um, recording or helping you record the introduction, putting it in. If you're going to take a break, putting in that language, like we'll be back in a minute. This is this sponsored by this. We'll be right back. That type of stuff. Um, putting your credits at the end, putting your music where it needs to go. Um, that's pretty basic podcast editing. Um, you also could rely on this person to be that sort of outside set of ears that listens to the hour long webinar and goes, here are the good parts. Here are the parts we should keep. Um, here are the parts that translate well to audio. And here's where we need a little piece of narration to explain what's happening. Um, so off the top of my head, that person is probably going to make like 80 to a hundred an hour, depending on their level of expertise. And I think you can, uh, you can expect them to spend two to three hours per episode, maybe more on the first episode while they're figuring out how the flow is going to be. Um, so I think it's, I think it's doable. And I think that if you do get sponsorship funding or some sort of grant or foundational funding, that is where the best use of that funding is going to be. Because that's the piece you're missing. I feel like y'all know how to market stuff. And you know how to talk about stuff. And you know what's interesting about your content and how to explain to a listener what is interesting about this and why they should care about this. If you do have funding, I think it's best spent on somebody who can take the sort of audio specific stuff off of your plate. That's what I was thinking too, just in terms of the logistics, because even if United Way Next decides to repurpose, you know, already existing content, it still needs to be wrapped and framed and branded and, you know, have all of those things that you were just describing, Laura, like the intros and the, you know, that it's, it's all still a part of the work. So I, I wondered too, and I, I was going to just resurface what Caitlin had posted about, well, what, what is the podcast even about and who's it for? And I feel like a lot of these questions are still kind of unanswered in a way because I think our group that's here today is still has different ideas about what we could really do with the podcast and I I love like when Diane said she wants to be the next Oprah I'm like yes that's the vision for how big this could be but then I also feel like well okay reasonably like scale back into Jim's point about like we could just repurpose some content so I feel like even just within this group that's very passionate about this project obviously everybody's here because they love the idea of it and discussing it but I still feel like it's not quite, the details are not like, because the organization does so much and it could have, you know, many different directions that it goes in. I'm not even sure that we really like have defined, like what is the podcast for current members? Is it for attracting new members? Is it, you know, I feel like there's still a lot to that. And I think Laura, as you were just talking kind of about what is this group missing? Like, I, I do think we all have like the passion. We're dedicated to this organization. We would love to see like this maybe be a, a product that's like beneficial for many of those reasons in the future, but it's kind of that like tying those loose ends together and it not being like falling the heavy lift falling on maybe a small group of volunteers. And of course not the heavy lift falling on, on like Carol and Caitlin to here's this big project run with it. You know? So I feel like we're still, I guess I want to add to what Laura just said about like the missing piece that we have is maybe hiring like a podcast consultant to to put together these like loose ends of like the music and the theme and the breaks and the logoing, the branding. But I would also even say like in getting our group to say, okay, like what what are your goals and how are you going to measure success? And, you know, like specifically outlining like that frequency and that sort of thing. And I don't know if maybe a part of that grant, if we're able to say, could we ask you know, whoever from foundation like to support this project for the next, give it a long time, like a two year, I, I don't know, whatever it might be, but to also add in some, some, um, you know, consulting fees that we could work with like a Laura Ellis to, to really still help this group pull all of this together so that it could be as successful as possible. And that knowing that none of us have like the editing skills to put the, you know, even once it's all laid out to like put the final product together so that it's not 
a lift that's falling on volunteers or staff. Yeah, it's like I mean, almost you have two different projects okay. to work on here. The project right. of refining and developing your idea and then the project mm -hmm. of making it. Right, right. You know, Diane's got her hand up, but we do have a, kind of a, an ad hoc subgroup of E&E &E, um, being Diane and Carrie and, and one other member. Um, you all, uh, I think, could make a recommendation about what you think um, the the future path should look like and uh, bring it back to the group and then to the board if there's money involved. Um, and if, there, if you feel like you have some other folks you need to recruit for your working group, that's for sure okay, too. Maybe some of the other people on this screen would be interested in being part of that work. Sorry to get in front of you, Diane. I know you have your hand up. No, it's it's totally okay because I'm actually um, starting to get a little excited again. So please be very afraid when that happens. Um, <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed that I completely set aside my fundraising hat um, for a part of this conversation. And Laura, when you talked about like seeking a funder, that's actually something that we've been talking about as well but then we thought we have to have like a proof of concept you know so this way people you know what it is that we're talking about we actually i'm maybe jumping like the whole committee process here so forgive me on this we were like let's kind of back burner this for a little bit but now i you know i think there might be an opportunity because what you have here with your questions actually serves as a really nice foundation for a potential proposal to a funder. And, you know, looking at answering these questions for a potential funder, you know, putting in the cost of the editing. But I also loved the idea of, you know, maybe getting, the, like Carrie said, like a po podcast development consultant, you know, like the Laura Ellis. So Laura, if you could put your email, you know, in <laughs> the chat box, you know, just to think about like, you know, if this would be something that you might be interested in, if we could continue that conversation, how much would that cost? And actually put that out there, see if we get the funding to help support us do that. And if we do, great, let's kind of do this test with the eight podcast, you know, the eight, you know, episodes podcasts. And if we don't get the funding, no, no harm, no loss, you know, so maybe that's one way to look at it. So I'm sorry to get excited again after I was like, let's kind of put this on the back burner, but you just threw a spark of life in us. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Listen, sometimes if you can find some money and throw the money at it, <laughs> it will get you over the finish line. Oh, I think Barbara is your hand. Your hand yeah, is I just yeah. had another idea that, you know, that the, uh, the small podcast group or some other small group could do would be just to you know, before we say, oh, we're going to make a podcast, but just to take one thing, you know, like pick a program that we've got recorded and just kind of listen to it, play with it, see what it could look like um, straight off of Zoom. I in <laughs> Not to do more work, but I remember Caitlin helped us when we did our brand um, unveiling. It was on Zoom. And we um, screwed up and we didn't turn the recording on soon enough. And we had this great intro with when the Saints come marching in, played by his jazz group at the United Way in New Orleans. It was, but we didn't record it. We had it recorded because that's how we got it. They didn't do it live. Um, but we screwed it up and we didn't put it in the, uh, it, we didn't start the recording soon enough. And Caitlin, all by herself. I don't know how much work it took you, Caitlin, but she figured out, or maybe somebody helped you, figured out how to put it together. And so we created the thing that we then put online for people to go listen to, but it really was already edited and, you know, took pieces and put it together. So Caitlin can speak about whether you did that all by yourself or you had a whole bunch of people helping you or how hard it was, but you know, I think there's some playing with this first before you go to the extreme of hiring somebody and saying we're going to do this many and all that stuff just to see what it feels like, see what it sounds like, see if it could work. I don't know. That's just where my head is at. 
it's a real chicken or the egg situation you're in right now. Well, realizing we have four minutes left for our session and that the time goes quickly, I guess I would just ask if there's any last question. I see Terry, you unmuted. So maybe Terry, you can bring us home. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No pressure. Um, I just wanted to, to say again, how much we appreciate the, your time that you've given us, Laura. It's really been great. And uh, and thank you to Louisville Public Media, both for your podcast incubator work that you do here in our Louisville community and for sharing your time and talent with us. Well, thank you. I'm amazed at how fast these sessions have flown by. <laughs> I keep coming in going, oh, my gosh, what am I going to be able to help them for an hour? And like it's always uh, over before I even feel like we scratch the surface. Yeah, I would echo Terry's words of appreciation on behalf of United Way Next and everyone who's really spent some time thinking about it for us. Others who are listening to this that didn't join today, but were part of maybe the first session and will listen in later, hopefully our example is one that they can help answer their own questions and go through it. So um, I would say I'm grateful to um, Sue and Ramound for joining us. They were not part of the first session, but obviously participated today to listen in. And, and I know he was in a spot that where he's quiet, so he can't talk a lot, but um, you know, just having others that participate in the conversation, hopefully this brought value for them as well. And we will, you know, unless there's other questions in the last two minutes that we're here together, um, we will take this all very seriously and bring it back to our Engage and Exchange work group. And I wanna thank Rodney and Diane and Carrie, who are the three that have been working on the podcast idea. They've met several times outside of the Engage and Exchange work group. And we really were moving forward pretty robustly until thanks to Terry, she brought you in, Laura. And it has caused us to pause and ponder and think, which I think is good before we step off that platform and go full bore. But we also might decide to repurpose content and it'll work for us. So lots of great, great ideas today. And even just the fundraising element that we do have a couple relationships with corporations that might be open to being a part of the podcast um, for us, a podcast incubator and decide what's next. So thanks I again. think you're on the right track. I mean, I think you've got a lot of brilliant people on the team and you'll figure it out. And you've got my email. So if you ever have any questions, seriously, just feel free to shoot me an email. That sounds great. Well, thanks again, Laura, for your time. And thanks to everybody for joining. If anybody wants to stay on for a moment and debrief, you're welcome to do that. Caitlin and I stay on always a few minutes after. Um, but thanks again for your time today. All right.